Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining CareerCert for our webinar today on special considerations for pediatric patients. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At CareerCert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to improve patient outcomes. And we are grateful for this opportunity to connect with you today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Quo Downing Reese. Quo Hi is guys. a senior vet veteran of EMS. She started her career in Los Angeles County, serving in a variety of settings, including private ambulance, fire, and hospital. Quo went to paramedic school at UCLA Daniel Freeman. She has a degree in EMS management from George Washington University and currently practices as a full-time critical care paramedic in Rochester, New York. She also does a variety of EMS and medical training as a career cert instructor, New York State Certified CIC, NAEMT instructor, and as an AHA Regional Training Center faculty. And Quo, I'll go ahead and let you take it from here. Thank you. So today we are talking about some uh, special pediatric circumstances that you may come across. Uh, just so you guys know, uh, we do record all of our webinars for uh, CAPC approval. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to have several different breaks uh, throughout the presentation where you guys can uh, chime in, send us a chat, uh, ask your questions. Uh, I will try to keep uh, some of the questions kind of short. If I didn't fully answer your question, uh, please let me know. And if I can't get to them online uh, right now, then I will definitely be more than happy to get to you with uh, email. Um, so as you can see, these are the objectives of our webinar today. Um, we're going to talk about things that are kind of going to discuss uh, not only the definitions that we're, we're using when we talk about pediatrics, um, and there's several different types of uh, definitions from different organizations. Uh, we'll talk about assessment tools that you might need, normal vital signs, because they differ uh, depending on the age group. We'll talk about anatomical differences, which really play a big role in some things like airway, uh, your AHA algorithms, things like that. Um, so we'll, we'll go over some of those little things that make uh, the anatomy different than just you know, saying that we have a small adult. There are, there are some differences. We're going to talk about shock. We're going to talk about uh, cyanotic and acyanotic circulatory uh, complications. Um, Feel free right now, send me where you're at and your level. Uh, so I know that this is open to both basic providers and uh, advanced providers, and we may have some critical care providers like myself. Um, and so for the uh, ENT basic, some of those things may have been something that you haven't covered before, uh, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna jump into a little bit of that kind of stuff. We're gonna talk a little bit about neonatal heart defects, um, and then we'll jump into trauma. And again, pediatrics, that anatomical differences really play a, a big role, uh, I think, in trauma. And then lastly, we're going to just kind of quickly go over some of the 2020 AHA guideline changes. Um, as you may or may not know, the AHA every five years does guideline changes or they reevaluate their algorithms. And so uh, this is uh, 2020 and they have come up with the new guideline changes. So we'll just kind of briefly discuss that. Uh, and there are uh, mainly, I would say most of the differences are again on a basic level. Uh, but they're, they're pretty significant. There was some pretty uh, good data that uh, has, has changed those guidelines. So, introductory. Uh, as most of you know, we do not deal with pediatric patients on a, a large scale, I would say. Uh, we tend to have more adult patients versus pediatric patients. So, our comfortable with pediatrics can can definitely be very varied depending on where you work, what kind of system you work in, um, your initial training, and then your ongoing training. We know that pediatric patients, they differ anatomically, physiologically, and emotionally from adults. It's, it's much easier to do a, a patient assessment on an adult when they can talk back to you and you can ask questions. 
um, versus the infant who, when you try to talk to them, they're not going to be able to understand you and be able to respond back to you. Um, so that really limits our communication abilities um, and uh, sometimes just at different life stages too, their willingness to be interactive with you also changes. Uh, so that, that kind of makes pediatric patients scary for a lot of providers. Um, this is what we kind of call those high risk, low frequency type of calls, where there could be a, a life or death situation, but we don't see it very often, and we're not always sure how we're gonna to go forth and treat this patient. And um, you know, protocols may be very slightly depending on where you're from and how aggressive your medical directors are, but. Um, we're going to try to hopefully get you guys feeling a little bit more comfortable with pediatrics and hopefully provide you guys some insight on some pediatric uh, stuff that will make you feel a little more comfortable. So we're going to start off with this little scenario. Uh, you are uh, AMS agency, uh, one o'clock in the morning, you've got this 12-year-old male and they're going to the ER for dyspnea. Now, when you first get that dispatch call for a 12-year-old with shortness of breath, what are some of the first thoughts that you're thinking? Um, you know, generally at 12, I'm not gonna be thinking of things like croup. Um, that, that's usually more kind of like a toddler uh, age group. Um, usually around 12, I'm thinking more of asthma. Do they have a common cold or flu? Do they have pneumonia? And of course, I'm sure everyone right now would be thinking, hey, do they have COVID? Should I be getting like every PPE available to me, right? Um, so you were called when the patient began experiencing severe trouble breathing. Okay, severe. So what kind of uh, physiological things am I gonna notice when, when I think of severe trouble breathing? I'm thinking, you know, are they gonna have retractions? Are they accessory muscle use? Uh, those kind of things, right, are coming into my mind. I'm, I'm probably thinking of protocol, um, going through, like, what can I provide? You know, as an EMT basic, you may feel like you're very limited on what you can provide um, versus a, a paramedic. You have more medications in your toolbox. Um, as a critical care, you've got even more. So you, you find out that your patient has a history of asthma, uh, but it looks like they are not very med compliant. They've been out of their rescue inhaler for over a month. Okay, so we know automatically that your your patient is not going to probably have taken anything prior to you getting there. Um, asthma, you're probably expecting to see wheezing, tripoding, uh, accessory muscle use, maybe some retractions, um, that pursed lip breathing, maybe uh, nasal flaring. So you've treated your patient so far with uh, albuterol, and if you are an ALS provider, uh, Atrovent, or what we uh, a lot of times would refer to as a duoneb, you see some relief. So here's your assessment so far. You've got a patient with a GCS of 15. You've got audible wheezing and retractions noted. I would expect them to be tachycardic, which they are, at a pulse of 122. It's regular and it's bounding. Blood pressure looks good, 110 over 62. SpO2 is 93%. How comfortable are you guys with 93%? They're on four liters with a nasal cannula. 93, okay, it's not horrible. It's not, it's not what I'd like to see, but it's not horrible, but we do have them on oxygen already, so I wish it would be a little bit higher. And you're noting that their respiratory rate is 32, uh, regular but labored. So at 118, the patient is reevaluated. Uh, you've got a patent airway. The physical reveals uh, thick secretions that they're not able to cough up. Breathing is rapid and forced. He continues to have retractions. The SpO2 with the nebulizer is only 95%. Again, better than it was before at 93, but I would like to see it higher. You've got diminished breath sounds with expiratory wheezing on auscultation. Now, do you guys know, is it better to hear expiratory wheezing or inspiratory wheezing? You may have both. And what if your patient isn't wheezing at all? Does that concern you? Do you go, oh, well, they're not wheezing, so that's okay. I know a ton of people that are asthmatic and they do not wheeze at all. They will never wheeze. 
Um, and it doesn't mean that they are not a severe asthmatic, and it doesn't mean that they're uh, moving air. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, pulses are still bounding. Now the skin signs are kind of starting to, to show some effects. You're starting to see kind of more of a pale and diaphoretic look. And the cap refill is three seconds. Now, on a 12-year-old, I would probably also get a, a blood pressure. This, this age, I shouldn't have any issues getting a blood pressure. Uh, but cap refill is still, still uh, using, um, is appropriate for an assessment tool. And uh, the patient's cooperative, but he's very fatigued. So where do you think we should go with this treatment? Um, what is allowed in your current protocols at your provider level? So again, for myself as a critical care paramedic, I actually have BiPAP available because I carry a vent with me at all times. Um, so I can actually BiPAP a patient. Um, we can do RSI in, in my uh, area. As an EMT basic though, you might only have albuterol available to you. Uh, some basics do have CPAP available, um, and then you always have your good old trusty BVM, right? Uh, and then as medications, we've, we've already done the Duonef. Uh, maybe as a, a basic provider, uh, you only have the albuterol. Uh, as a ALS provider, I'm also going to be looking at some kind of steroid, either dexamethasone or solumedrol. And do I need to start thinking of uh, I am epi, maybe even uh, mag uh, sulfate on board as a drip. So kind of just keeping all that in the back of your head. All right, so we'll go back to that scenario, but let's break in and talk about some definitions as far as your pediatric patients, because there's a lot of different definitions depending on who you ask, right? And um, it can change where you take that patient or how you treat that patient. So let's look up some of the vocabulary. HA provided those definitions that you see here for neonates, infant, toddler, preschooler, school age, pre-adolescent, and adolescent. However, there's some other definitions that you may or may not be aware of. So uh, I started in Los Angeles County. In Los Angeles County, we can only transport patients to an emergency department that is approved for pediatrics, known as an EDAT. Some of you may have uh, heard that term before. Um, and an EDAT can take patients uh, up to the age of 14, that is considered a pediatric patient. Um, and, and that is so that the emergency room is uh, stocked with the appropriate staff um, and the appropriate equipment that uh, is needed for pediatric patients. Um, some hospitals, I transport to several different hospitals in my area and one emergency room, pediatric patients is considered anyone under the age of 18. The other hospital, pediatric patients is anyone under the age of 21. So you have to know, depending on which hospital you're going to, am I going to the pediatric ED or am I going to the adult ED? I've also had EDs where they'll take up to even age 25 because for insurance purposes, medical insurance purposes, a lot of them will go up to age 25 if the patient gets their medical insurance through a parent. So it'll go up to age 25. We've also recently been taking patients up to the age of 25 to some of our EDs because of COVID. So what we were once only doing up to age 18, they now expanded up to the age of 25 because of COVID. With the influx of people coming in with COVID-like symptoms, the pediatric EDs weren't really seeing as many patients. The adult EDs were really getting bombarded, and so they, they extended the age uh, for a while to kind of even it out for the uh, nurses and the doctors. So just kind of something to think about as far as your your algorithms, your treatments, and where you transport to. Um, the other thing to kind of keep in mind too is for AHA, so the AHA provided you all of those definitions uh, that are bulleted up there, but they also tell you when you take your BLS class, that when you have a patient that is the age of eight, uh, 
or show signs of puberty, which is around age eight, after that, you treat them as an adult. So that can be very confusing. So I use pediatric pads on a patient that's less than age eight or does not have signs of puberty yet. Or if they're an infant, which is less than one, right, anywhere between one month to, to one year. And then if you've taken it, the HA actually also uh, is involved in the neonatal resuscitator program, the NRP program, which is from birth to one month. So there's a lot of kind of confusing overlap, and that's why we kind of had this pediatric vocabulary uh, input. All right. So here is one way that you can kind of get your basic vital signs. So you can see that vital signs really vary between those age groups. Um, if I told you that a patient had a systolic of, you know, 64, if I didn't give you an age and I said that their systolic is 64, you'd probably be freaking out. However, if I'm talking about a, a patient that was just born, 64 would be appropriate. Um, so this is, these little uh, kind of cheat sheets or, or pocket guides are, are great if you don't really see a lot of pediatric patients and you're not really sure what the normal ranges are for those age groups. Um, those are important to know so that you can really assess how severe your your patient is and and what you need to do for them are are they considered chalky uh, is their respiratory rate way too fast is their pulse way too slow um, it changes between if they're sleeping or if they're awake so if i'm looking at an infant who is sleeping i would expect that their rate is going to be slower than when they're awake so those are all kind of things that we have to kind of keep in in the back of our heads. And a lot of us, we don't see enough pediatric patients to really feel comfortable with their vital signs. If I ask you for an adult all day long, I'm sure all of you guys could raise your hand and answer that question right away. We all know, you know, uh, normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, uh, normal heart rate, 60 to 100. That stuff is really easy. But when we start getting into pediatric patients, sometimes we're not so sure. So having some of these little pocket guides are, are a great tool. So if you've taken the PALS class, or if you've taken the EPC class, the emergency pediatric course uh, that the NAEMT uh, provides, you've seen this pediatric assessment triangle. This is our kind of real easy, quick assessment, primary assessment tool that is sick, not sick. So if a pediatric patient is critical versus if they're a stable patient that I can take a little bit more time with to assess. This is that um, I'm at the door, I, I'm looking across the room at my patient and I'm just looking quickly to see how do they appear? Do they seem like they're awake? Do they seem like they're not moving? Are they tracking me? Those kind of things. Um, their work of breathing. Can I see them breathing from across the room? Or can I hear them breathing from across the room? Here it is not important to have exact numbers. This is more of a determine is it too fast or too slow or does it look to be within uh, normal limits? And the same thing with circulation of the skin. I don't need an actual pulse rate here. I'm just looking, do they look pale? Do they look mottled? Do they look diaphoretic? Do they look cyanotic? It's just a very quick, shouldn't take you more than about 10 seconds to assess this. Um, this is that uh, stay and play or load and go kind of uh, primary assessment tool. One of the other tools that you have are, is called a Braslo tape. Um, and Braslo tape is a great way to just quick reference chart based off of height or uh, the length of a pediatric patient, and then kind of an estimated weight uh, based on this color-coded system. And so once you've measured your patient with the Brazel tape, as you can see the woman in pink there doing with that child, you see you start at the head and you go down to the heel of their foot. That child looks like they fall into the purple category. 
and then you would look at your Braswell tape in the purple, and then it would give you automatic numbers for things like your ET tube size, your laryngoscope blade size, uh, your defibrillation dosages. Uh, it'll also give you your dosages for your medications. So it's just a nice quick way to kind of uh, double check or if you don't like to do med math in your head, it gets really confusing sometimes during med math. It gives you your dosages right there for you. So those are just some kind of quick pediatric assessment tools. There are definitely more of them. Um, but these are just things that we use on a daily basis when we are discussing pediatric patients um, and how we're going to uh, assess them and understand what we're looking for. So it's important to remember that these anatomical differences uh, will influence your treatment decisions and how you'll manage your pediatric patients. For instance, due to that larger occiput and kind of funnel-shaped upper airway, the snake position would be better suited for a pediatric patient uh, than the kind of full head tilt, chin lift with that hyper-extended position that we normally would use for an adult. Um, Flexing the pediatric airway too far can also cause an airway obstruction. Their cartilage rings uh, are not as developed yet, and so they are more likely to actually cause tracheal collapse if you go too far uh, with the extension. Um, the, the pediatric airway is smaller in diameter. It's shorter in length. Uh, that makes intubation sometimes a lot harder. Uh, it's more... Uh, superior and anterior, making it difficult to really see uh, the cords well. That glottic opening, um, the, the glottis itself is tends to be uh, floppy, kind of a little bit bigger in comparison to adults who are trying to lift up that upper glottis, and uh, it can make it a little bit difficult to see. Um, for my advanced providers, uh, you may have heard before, uh, a lot of people like to use a Miller blade to get that glottis out, the epiglottis out of the way um, and have a better view of the glottic opening versus putting it in the vallecula uh, because that just that glottis, epiglottis is so floppy. It tends to hang down even if you're in the vallecula so, uh, with a Mac blade. So a lot of uh, providers, advanced providers would tell you that they prefer a Miller blade. Um, so the little things like that that, you know, may change how you normally would would intubate. For instance, I prefer a MAC blade, but in that pediatric patient, I may say, you know what, I'm going to go with a Miller blade just because I know that their epiglottis tends to be a lot more floppy than the adult. And so I may have a better first pass success if I use that Miller blade instead. Um, the lungs are going to be smaller. Um, the heart is higher. So when you're talking about trauma, that's going to have uh, some effect depending on where they're getting hit in their chest versus where an adult had gotten hit. So those are just things that you have to remember with your pediatric patient versus your adult patient. I'm so used to seeing that adult patient when I get that pediatric, I'm not even thinking about some of those things. And that can really, uh, really change how well you are able to treat your patient. Like I said, a lot of that, what is here in the anatomical differences, really plays a, a strong role in my ability to control their airway. Um, I may need to pad behind the shoulders. Uh, I may need to have that kind of, you know, blankets or pillow or something available that I wouldn't even be thinking about maybe with an adult patient. So, you know, do I need to bring in different equipment with me or make sure that I have some extra stuff with me um, that I wouldn't normally if I was uh, dealing with a, an adult patient? So we go back to our scenario. It's now 1.25 in the morning, and the patient is on continuous duonev, uh with a max of three. They've been given that methylprednisone and the mag sulfate for the management of their asthma. I'm surprised that they didn't uh, give them the epi-2. Uh, chest x-ray is ordered, and the physician calls the pediatric intensivist that the children's possible for a possible transfer which means that you're probably gonna get called now for that transfer if you are one of those systems that does IFT. So 
you're going to get this long story from the very beginning all the way up to uh, when that physician wanted to call for that transfer. Um, children's hospitals, it's got to go directly to the pediatric floor. How long is it going to take you to transfer? Um, all those kind of things are going to be kind of important. Do they fly or are they going to go by ground, right? Is it safe to fly with them having a severe difficulty breathing? Um, is there things that I want to do before then, such as possibly intubate before we go so that I don't have somebody crashing on me in the back of the rig or in mid-flight? So 30 minutes later, it says the patient's work of breathing is reported as improving, and the chest radiograph shows hyperinflation of the lungs, typically seen with a child with asthma. And uh, you arrive and you begin your assessment, uh, obtaining a report from the ED personnel. So hopefully they give you a good report. Uh, sometimes you have to, I feel like, kind of pull that information out. You need to ask, can I see that chest x-ray? Can I see their lab? What have they gotten so far? Kind of get that whole story. Sometimes you get a very uh, short report that doesn't give you a lot of information. Um, I know that I a lot of times have to ask personnel to give me a little bit more information and they kind of look at me like I have three heads. Like, why are you asking that? I would like to know what their x-ray looks like. Um, it may change how I want to provide them um, ventilatory support for instance, um, you know, I want to know what I should set my PEEP value to. Uh, so some of those things do do really matter, and I don't want to cause barrel trauma to my patients. Um, so those things that you normally get in a report, you might have to dig in a little bit deeper. Does anyone have questions so far? I know that was a lot of information in a kind of small amount of time. Okay. Um, so respiratory conditions, I'm going to kind of just quickly talk about this. Uh, you see there is croup. Um, I think most of us have learned about that usually with the younger children, um, usually under the age of three, right? Um, epiglottitis, three to five. Uh, and that, the big thing there is remembering do not go into that patient's airway unless you plan on being able to do a crike. Uh, that patient may laryngeal spasm on you and you will not be able to pass the tube. So you have to be very, very careful with that. Um, remember the four Ds, the dysphagia, dysphonia, drooling, and distress. That patient's usually going to be sitting forward with their tongue kind of almost hanging out their mouth. Um, and drooling because they can't even swallow. Um, so I think the biggest thing there is just remembering the four Ds when you're talking about uh, epiglottitis. We already kind of talked about asthma, right? That narrowing and constriction. Um, and our management, if you are able to, is bronchodilators, corticosteroids. If you need to, get that mag on board. If you can, um, CPAP or BiPAP. Um, remember that not all pediatric patients are going to wheeze on you um, that have asthma. Uh, so don't think about, oh, they're not wheezing, they're fine. Um, if they have a history of asthma, that's one of the questions I always ask. Do you wheeze? Or I ask the parents, do they wheeze or not? Um, is that normal for them to not wheeze? The second question I always ask is, have they ever been intubated before? If someone tells me that they've been intubated before, I have a much higher uh, likelihood of them needing to be intubated again. And so it's definitely gonna kind of push me a little bit further to kind of act a little bit quicker. Um, I'm really gonna watch that uh, stat. I'm gonna watch my end tidal CO2. Uh, I've seen patients who are statting great and they still crash on you. Remember that that SpO2 stat versus your end tidal CO2, there's a big disparity. So I could have a pediatric um, stat probe on their finger and it will stay, you know, 95%, 96% for two minutes, even if they stopped breathing. It takes, it takes a minute to two minutes to really start seeing that stat probe uh, 
uh, number drop versus an end title CO2 number, that I'm going to see change right away. Uh, so it's really important. If I'm looking at waveforms with my end title CO2, um, we're talking about asthma, I'm going to expect to see that shark fin waveform. Um, and I'm, I'm going to pay more attention to that number than I am the stat. Um, don't get so caught up on your monitors and the numbers. Remember to use all of your diagnostic abilities. Look at your patient. Does your patient look like they're about to tire out and stop breathing? Um, then treat them like they are. Um, just because it says that they're starting at 95 or 96, treat them like they look like they're going to stop breathing because likelihood is that they are. Uh, bronchiolitis um, can a lot of times present as asthma. So the big thing that I just normally ask is, do they have a history of asthma? If they don't have a history of asthma, then it could very well be bronchiolitis. And I may not know that in the field uh, right away. Um, I may see more if I had a chest x-ray and I can see the inflammation and I can see the patchy infiltrates in, in the uh, chest x-ray. Uh, but uh, tends to be with children under the age of two. So I really wouldn't expect like a 12-year-old to have bronchiolitis. Um, remember, one of the main causes of bronchiolitis is RSV, uh, which is the respiratory syncytial virus. Um, you can get that as an adult. So you, you can't rule it out even after the age of two. In fact, I actually had RSV last year. So um, it can happen to even adults, uh, especially if they were around uh, somebody who had RSV. And I'm around patients all the time that have RSV. So I unfortunately did catch it uh, as an adult. Um, but the, the treatment is fairly the same as it would be um, for for asthma, if you're not really sure um, if it's bronchiolitis versus asthma. Um, but if they don't have a history of asthma, I'm probably going to lean a little bit more towards bronchiolitis or some kind of common cold or flu, or at this point right now, probably still COVID. Um, pneumonia, right? Um, and it can be caused by several different things. Um, but uh, one of the things that I need to know about a patient with pneumonia is um, a common reason for for a, a child or for um, an adult that has a child uh, looking into uh, pneumonia is, um, is it a community-acquired pneumonia? Um, that's kind of the common reason for seeking medical treatment and hospitalization in, in childhood. Um, one of the most important decisions in the management of acute lower respiratory tract infections in childhood is uh, whether we are treating the child uh, ambulatory or we're going to admit them. Um, and so one of the things that I might want to know is where did that patient get that pneumonia? Um, did they, were they recently uh, exposed to somebody who had pneumonia and um, like what was that person treated with? For their pneumonia. Um, we know that some causes of pneumonia may be resistant to certain antibiotics, right? Um, and pediatric pneumonia is usually not that common. So I want to know how that child got that pneumonia so that I can really uh, focus in on treating that pneumonia with the appropriate uh, antibiotic. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to probably be a little bit more um, concerned with the likelihood of them needing uh, more major medical interventions, just because, again, pediatric patients don't usually get pneumonia. So if they got pneumonia, it's probably pretty aggressive, um, and it's probably going to predict some of the severity of, of that pediatric patient. Um, so my initial assessment will influence kind of my microbiology uh, and, and how I want to treat with antibiotics, what, the length of that treatment. Um, and I know a lot of that stuff doesn't really maybe in your mind matter to you because you're just going, hey, I'm pre-hospital. I don't, I don't give them antibiotics. I don't, um, I don't, I don't see them after I drop them off at the ED, uh, 
But remember that our care, how we start, is going to have a drastic effect on their long-term prognosis. Um, we found that demonstrating increasing proportional um, amounts of viral and, and subsequent decrease in bacterial pneumonia um, in line with other kind of pneumonia etiologies uh, after implementation of like kind of routine immunization um, really makes a big change in the etiology that will affect their clinical presentation. And how I treat them will, again, in the long term, help resource out what things they need what I need to test for, what antibiotics they're going to need. So for you as a pre-hospital provider, getting a really good story makes a big difference. And then if you get that really good story, me as the critical care transport, I'm going to have a lot more information um, and it may affect what I am doing. Um, like my PEEP values and my ventilator settings and things like that. So while for a lot of you guys, it doesn't seem like it really matters that much to get that much information about how they may have caught pneumonia because you feel like you're not going to see them later, uh, some of us will see them later and it may affect um, how well they're doing when we see them. Um, ARDS. So um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, I, I really kind of more or less bring this up because uh, with COVID, we're seeing a lot of patients right now that are presenting very similar to ARDS. Um, they have the same type of lung chest x-rays. Um, they have a lot of the same kind of difficulty, high PEEP, um, really hard to ventilate. Um, and so if you're not very familiar with ARDS, I would say uh, read up on it a little bit more, become more familiar with that term. Um, we, they've started, if you, if you haven't been uh, exposed to ECMO before, um, ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation um, and pediatric um, they did that for not only ours, but for some other conditions that we'll get into later. And um, this is definitely something that has happened and, and that we see in our pediatric uh, population, but we're also starting to see now even in adults and with this COVID who um, are really presenting poorly. So something to kind of keep your, your mind um, in and, and take the time to study up a little bit more about ARDS. Um, I wish I could go into more detail about it, but with the time frame, I don't have a lot of time to go into it. But so now your patient, it's two or two, they're unresponsive, they've got that shark fin appearance that I was talking about. You and your partner want to bag mask ventilate them. Um, you, you choose your ET tube size. You successfully intubate them. You've used your untitled CO2 monitoring. Um, their fat is 93% and their end title is 45, which, okay, is, is decent. Um, and you also start an inline NEB as you're moving to transport. Anything else you guys want to consider? Um, any other questions? I know I'm moving super, super fast, and I'm sorry. There's so much information that we wanted to get to. Okay, if you, um, if you have a question and I don't get to you, please, by all means, at the end, Danielle will give you information on how to email me. So I'll move on so I don't think that there are any questions at this time. Um, so shock, we know that there's a whole bunch of different things that can cause shock in a pediatric patient. Um, hypertension, remember, in a pediatric patient is a late and ominous sign in an infant or a young child um, and can urgently uh, needs to be treated before they go into cardiac arrest. Remember, kids are really, really, really great at uh, compensating, compensating, compensating until they don't. And then they just drop precipitously, right? Uh, and if you remember your algorithm, um, 
with your pediatric patient with a pulse less than 60 beats per minute with signs of poor perfusion, you start compressions. And it may seem weird that you're doing compressions on somebody who may even be awake and, and looking at you or be able to talk to you, but this is why, because it is a very ominous sign. And if they are hypotensive and they're shocky and they're now at a point where they are, their blood pressure is low and their heart rate is low, they're not going to be much longer talking to you if they're still talking to you. So keep that in mind with, with kids. They, they do compensate really, really, really well. And then they crash really, really fast. So there are your uh, categories of shock. Um, some of the causes of those categories, like I said, we'll talk kind of quickly about congenital heart diseases. Um, the hemodynamics behind those. So you can see there are actual differences. Uh, in the hemodynamics of each type of shock. And so that is going to change on what kind of drugs you want to use or fluid resuscitation or um, positioning. Um, all those are going to change based on are we talking about a preload problem? Are we talking about a decreased uh, system, systemic vascular response? Um, is there a decreased cardiac output or increase? Those all change, um, and you, you can have a child in shock who has increased preload, and you can have a child in shock with decreased preload. So if you can really understand the different types and what's causing it, then you can treat it appropriately. Um, hypovolemic shock is going to be the number one most common shock for your pediatric patient, um, which is characterized by inadequate intravascular volume. Um, it's probably the leading cause of child mortality worldwide. Um, we are privileged to live in a first world country and we have, you know, for the most part, most of us have food and water and uh, medicine and things like that. Uh, but um, hypovolemic shock in a lot of the world is really going to be due to gastrointestinal uh, issues, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, poor nutrition, um, that loss of uh, interstitial or third spacing kind of losses. Um, we don't have that as much here. Generally, when we're talking about hypovolemia, it's usually going to be either, um, you know, blood loss. You may have some dehydration, um, but usually not to the extent that we're, t we're talking about in some of those third world countries. But um, what kind of IVs do you have? Do you have only normal saline available to you, or do you also have um, lactated ringers available? Um, do you have TXA available to you, um, blood products? Um, so those may be something that you want to consider and um, think about, uh, which is important for that patient. Do I need something that's an isotonic solution, or do I want a hypertonic solution for this patient? Um, Again, your, your shock conditions and your stages of, of shock and what you are going to see, right? So again, if they're in that severe loss um, and they get to that point where they're gonna be severely tachycardic, they're gonna be that way and then they're gonna drop. Um, and it's gonna be really, really quick. Um, Around stage three is when they're not really going to compensate very well. Um, and stage four, death is imminent. Um, if they do not get treatment, they will uh, unfortunately uh, die. Um, and so we really want to get them before they reach that stage four because it's really hard to kind of turn that corner if they get to stage four with that pediatric patient. Um, and remember to keep your patients warm when they're in shock. Keep them covered. Keep that ambulance warm, especially if you're in places like me where it snows. Um, so if you remember, most of you will remember uh, with your pediatric patients, you're going to have a 20 cc per kg uh, fluid boluses. Um, and if we're talking about blood products for the advanced providers that are able to carry blood products, it's a 10 cc per kg. Um, and then uh, for shock, uh, be careful. If you're talking about cardiogenic 
shock. You may want to scale back a little bit on your boluses if you're worried about um, pulmonary edema. So if you're hearing uh, some fluid in the lungs, you may want to do uh, 10 cc per kg boluses or do it over a longer period of time so that you don't get those uh, more fluid going into their lungs. And that's, again, why it's very important to kind of understand the different types of shock and understand what you're doing and how it may change your your treatment. If I just go, oh, this kid's in shock, and I fill them a whole, with a whole bunch of fluids, but they're in cardiogenic shock, I may actually kill that patient by drowning them, um, really, in their own kind of fluid. So understanding those differences is very important. And if we're talking about an infant with some of the cardiogenic uh, heart defects, uh, you can definitely cause more harm than good. Uh, so this is where understanding those pediatric patients and understanding the anatomy and the pathophysiology kind of behind some of these things um, really makes a difference on how you treat that patient. Um, hemodynamic profiles in pediatric heart failure. Um, so you can see the, the warm and dry versus the cold and dry versus the warm and wet versus the cold and wet. Um, so kind of understand these things again. And this, is a, this goes again onto like, how do I want to provide them care? How do I need to, do I need to give them uh, a presser? Do I need to give them fluid? Do I need to um, increase their their inotropy, their dromotropy? Um, these these things are kind of important to know, so you know which medication is more appropriate for that patient. Do I want to give them norepi versus do I want to give them dopamine? Let's say for that shock patient, right? Um, if you understand what's causing the failure to begin with, then you have a better idea of what medication would be the most appropriate versus just kind of what I call copic medicine. Um, <clears throat> distributive, again, there's four types of distributive shock. So there's neurogenic, anaphylactic, uh, dissociative, and septic. So again, uh, understand the difference between those. Uh, your major treatment goals for distributive shock are gonna be stopping uh, vasodilation returning volume to the intravascular space and improving tissue perfusion. Um, really all four of those type of shocks, the neurogenic, anaphylactic, dissociative, and septic sh uh, shock are all distributive shock and they all have the same treatment goals, okay? Um, neurogenic being some kind of vascular tone loss uh, due to sympathetic nervous system injury, um, either to the central nervous system, uh, usually the spinal cord, okay? Um, and, and treatment often necessitates administration of uh, basal active medication. Uh, however, volume replacement with crystalloids should happen first, okay? You got to fill the tank first and then make the container smaller, okay? And, and with pediatric patients, they're already small. So keep that in mind. Um, there's your anaphylactic shock, okay? And, and if it's anaphylactic shock now, I'm looking at, at epi right away, getting that epi on board, probably uh, Benadryl on board um, versus the previous, the neurogenic. Um, diphenhydramine isn't gonna do anything for the anaphylactic shock, right? But they're both distributed, so just again, Understanding what you're looking at will understand, uh, will kind of steer your treatment for those patients, right? Finding out if they're allergic to anything. Um, dissociative shock. This is kind of a rare form of shock in the pediatric population. Um, it's not often included in traditional um, classifications of shock. So dissociative shock is a hemoglobin molecule is, is unable to give up oxygen to the tissue. So the, the tissue perfusion, it appears normal, but the release of oxygen is not. Um, so it may or may not uh, occur in conjunction with other conditions, such as things like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or um, 
let's see, uh, dyshemoglobinuria, cyanide poisoning, um, things like that, um, that we don't always really think about. Um, this isn't something that you're going to see often, um, but the biggest way to treat for this is removing them from that environment and giving them oxygen regardless of what their oxygen stat reads. Because remember, their oxygen stat is going to read high, but the rest of their tissue and body is not actually getting um, that oxygen. It's still staying on the hemoglobin and not, not being released. So it'll read high, but the tissues themselves are not going to get that uh, oxygen because it's not being released from the hemoglobin. Um, sepsis, uh, so the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, and sepsis are both clinical shock syndromes character characterized by uh, inflammation and vasodilation. Um, SIRS in pediatric patients is usually an inflammatory inflammatory response that may result from uh, injury, trauma, or infection. Uh, hallmarks for SEERS would be things like uh, altered thermal regulation, um, you see tachycardia, tachypnea, um, age-specific alterizations in um, their, their white blood cell count. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, they're gonna have uh, low numbers of neutrophils, um, known as neutropenia. Uh, uh, bendemia is also present, uh, meaning that certain bands of uh, immature white blood cells are released into the bloodstream in excess. Uh, so you may not have heard the term SEERS before. You, I'm, I'm sure, have all heard of sepsis, uh, but SEERS is kind of a, a slightly uh, different things uh, of, is, is, is a type of sepsis, I guess you could say. Um, and, you know, normally your body likes to keep balance. It's homeostasis. And your body cannot do that when you're in uh, sepsis based off of SIRS. So um, if the pathogens are contained prior to onset of impairment, then uh, secondary infection may ensue, leading to uh, increased morbidity and mortality. Um, so it's kind of important that you can, can figure that out um, before you get to that point. Um, sepsis is, is 10 times more common in children under the age of one than it is in older children. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, pediatric sepsis. Uh, sepsis is commonly encountered in the ED, uh, and when it is, it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality um, in, in the pediatric population uh, versus uh, adult patients uh, that go septic um, have a better chance than a pediatric patient when they're septic, okay? Um, and see, these... So a systolic blood pressure less than 90 is normally for sepsis, but now when we're talking about pediatric patients, less than 90 is not necessarily going to be true. So these shock condition things, remember that we're normally used to seeing, is going to be different for your pediatric patients, right? And if you're unfamiliar, always think that you can call med control and say, hey, this is what I've got. I think they may be septic. Um, and if you're not sure, because you're not sure of the the right um, uh, the right vital signs, then they can kind of steer you the right way. Um, how much CO exposure is needed if we take a kid out of a fire scene? Um, so if you have like a life pack 15 monitor or like a zone monitor and it can measure, um, I would tell you that if it pulls up a CO, um, usually over 14, but anything that reads up CO, if it comes up at anything, um, I will generally um, always take them from the scene if there's a fire, if they were exposed, um, and and get them at least primarily checked out. And yes, there would be increased respirations with sepsis. Um, yes, for uh, whoever asked that. Uh, I would expect to see increase, just like it says respiratory rate greater than 20. Um, I would expect them. So pediatric patients, remember, already have a higher um, rate of respirations. So remember, they're going to be much, much higher. So like for that infant patient, if they're like 60 
breath, I mean, so like one a second, um, that's how fast you can literally see some of these kids breathing that are um, septic. Um, and anytime you think that the patient may have um, a carbon monoxide exposure, remember, do not withhold oxygen from them. Try to give them oxygen, even if it's by blow by for a pediatric patient, and have them evaluated in the emergency room if they're reading positive on your um, monitor or if fire tells you that there was uh, a carbon monoxide um, leak. Yes, well, thank you so much, Quo, for joining us today, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Uh, visit us at careercert.com for more webinars and resources to help prepare you to improve patient outcomes. Thank you again for connecting us with us today, and thank you so much for your sacrifices to make our communities safer places. Take care and stay safe.